So let's quickly talk about the underlying issue that faces us all. So global healthcare spending. I'm sure you heard about this across all your professors when you are in the bioengineering programs. So the global healthcare spending has been projected to increase more than 5% uh, from 2018 to 2022, which is a major increase from the last five years, which is about 3%. And also, every day we've been talking about the aging population. So by 2022, globally, there will be more than 668 million people estimated that's over the age of 65 globally. And that's, 11, that's more than 11% of the global population. So as we enter into the smart healthcare generation, the ecosystem actually demand a more effective and a more cost-effective solutions, uh, and they demand treatments that's delivered to the patients at the appropriate time, at the appropriate location. And clinicians want better technologies actually to help the patients in real time and better. And the hospitals wanted to bring the cost down to make things more effective. So why it doesn't matter to talk about the bigger picture? Because when I was talking with Jack earlier today, I was asking Jack what's the typical typical career path for bioengineer students, and he told me some of the students actually go to the hospital, become a technician, and uh, to help the hospital to tune all this, the equipment. But you can actually do much more than that, because I'll explain why we enter into healthcare investment in the future. But as a bioengineer student, if you have, if you have an idea, you have a solution, you think something can be changed in the future, you actually can do that. And uh, then the, there is actually a major doctor called shortage globally. So according to uh, health uh, WHO, so on average, there are still 45% of the countries in their member states that has one, less than one clinician per 1,000 patients. But then if you break it down into different countries, actually the problem change. So obviously when you, when you look at the uh, a country like Singapore, Australia, or US, the problem is actually not enough physicians. Actually, as a matter of fact, we have too many physicians, but there is an imbalance between the general clinicians versus the specialists. So for example, in Singapore, everyone wants to become a specialist because you, get, you make the big money and then you can retire much earlier and have the fame. But as the aging population earlier we said start to increase, the Having more, having too many uh, specialists actually doesn't solve the problem. So imagine if you are elder, 70 years old, who go to a hospital, then you probably have to see five or six different kinds of specialists, heart specialists, specialists, brain specialists, cardiologists, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So actually now in this part of the world, we want better technology who can bring the GPs more, more access and more power for them to manage the populations. And then if you move to the emerging markets, the problem suddenly change. So if you go to India, for example, uh, there is a huge shortage of the, of the clinicians. So let's use uh, uh, ophthalmology as an example. So in the India as a whole, there are 75 million diabetics uh, which require ophthalmologists. But then as a country, there is only 25,000 ophthalmologists in total and that's on the specialist side. And then, if you go to emerging countries like India, China, or uh, Indonesia, the urban and the rural disbursement of the doctors also change dramatically. For example, 70% of the population in India live in rural. But as a matter of fact, 70% of the physicians, the specialists, live in urban. So all of this brings major problem to our healthcare needs nowadays. And then if you look at the healthcare technology as a trend, I'm sure different profs tell you different things. We have been evol evolving in the past three different decades. It started as the traditional hardware equipment and consumable. So for example, your typical hospital equipment, etc. And then you, in the last decade, you move into smart wearables. So your Apple Watch, your Fitness, all the wearable sensors and things. And now we're in the, in the era of moving into robotics, AI and uh, smart technologies. And there's few reasons why this trend is uh, inevitable. Because number one, as I mentioned before, the rising cost of the Asian population, people are becoming more demanding. And because of all the change 
the wearable and the smart technologies, all the apps that we use, now people are closer to your own health than before. Because before you go to a hospital, the clinician tell you what to do, and you just listen. So nowadays, patients want to be part of the treatment in the ecosystem. And also, there's a lot more data nowadays. So by the next two years, there's going to reach one gigabyte of healthcare data. That's 10 to the power of 24. And I don't know what that number is actually, but it's big. So there's no human being can actually understand or interpret the amount of unstructured healthcare data it is. So which is why it's a big problem. And then there is a lot of startups globally trying to conquer the problems. So I was surprisingly learned maybe the students today don't really know what venture capital is. So I'll, I'll give a quick uh, uh, 30 second summary. So when you build a startup, before you start to sell, uh, you have to pay your cost, you have to pay your R&D, you have to pay your employee, and then you don't have any money. So that's when people come in to fund you and give you the money. And that's what uh, uh, fund investment do. So usually a lot of times if you want to build a uh, startups. You start with government grants. Across different countries, there is multiple different grants, and then you move on to, like, for example, bank loans, or and then soon you 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 move on to a C to Series A stage. So your last critical stage before you start to make money, and then it's called uh, venture capital, and that's where we come in. And then as you hit revenue generating stage, it change um, uh, significantly. So where I work for is called Pure Land Venture. We're an impact-driven uh, medtech-focused fund. So we invest in both hardware and software, anything we feel can be successful, can inject value into patient care system, save lives, reduce uh, demand supply gaps. So our mission, for example, is to bring healthcare access and uh, saving to 100 million people globally in the next five years. And we're doing pretty well, I feel. So, uh, Till now, we have invested more than 12 companies globally, some in the US, some in India, Singapore, Hong Kong, Taiwan, etc. Et so I'll give you guys some of the examples of what bioengineer students can do. So first one is a company from the US, it's called Leo Cancer Care. So not sure how familiar you guys are with uh, radiotherapy treatments. So when you get cancer, usually one of the major treatment is radiotherapy treatments. And traditionally, the people are lying on the bed and then send into the machine and then you rotate the photon machine to shoot the laser beams across the cancer area for targets. And then this is very expensive and also requires a large a lot of amount of rooms in the hospital. So this startup, they changed the completely solution. Instead of sending the patient in uh, lying down, now they rotate the patient sitting on the chair, shoot the laser beams from the top to uh, from the uh, front of the patients and uh, pick it up at the back of the patients. As a result, you don't need to build a hospital bunker. So how much does that cost? That's on average uh, one to two million dollars USD saving for hospital. And then in a lot of countries, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore, US, European, you have the hospital that's already, already built. So when you need to design a hospital bunker for any type of CT room or radiotherapy room, it takes time, a large amount of projects and planning. So now, for the hospital doesn't have enough capacity, they can just take the machine in uh, like that. And then also the company build their own artificial intelligence machine learning, being able to increase the target area for the cancer treatment. So it's uh, pretty cool but also requires a lot of engineers and hard work to get it done for uh, advanced manufacturing machine like that. And then this is uh, my favorite company, always talk about it. So as I was talking about in India, uh, there's about 75 million diabetics. So as you guys might know, when you get diabetics, the disease doesn't kill you, but there's a lot of side diseases. So one thing is called diabetes retinopathy. That means the glucose level in your blood goes goes up to your eye, and then as the pressure starts to increase, it starts to pop your blood vein at the back of your eye, and then you become blind. So about 30% of the serious stage diabetes patients actually become blind at the end. So a diabetes doctor cannot really tell if you have an eye problem or not. You need a specialist 
So uh, I stand for this. And as, as I mentioned earlier, there's only 25,000 uh, ophthalmology in India or live in the urban area. So what does the problem do? Like nowadays, people don't really care. So we invested into a company that built an AI uh, off the line, which is important for India. And then uh, uh, 10 seconds, 93 to 96% accuracy. So now with the uh, low cost high end phonoscope hardware, you can put one of these uh, camera in any of the diabetes clinics. And then when the patient comes in, the nurse can do the screening. And then after the screening, the AI will run, will tell the patient, do you have the problems? You don't have the problems. And if you have the DR problems, then they get to refer to a specialist, which people go much uh, more often. And then right now, the company has six different devices across the IA functions being used in 1,000 clinics globally. And then it's, uh, it touched more than seven people's life already. Uh, and then this is actually a and Mark, uh, this is an interesting product because uh, I met with the company colleague before. The white color part is the, is the lens. And the, the back thing you know, is actually a mobile phone, you know, uh, uh, like that. So you connect with the lens and then take a photograph. So it's not nothing, you know, a doctor need to invest the, or train a lot uh, like that. But it's a, it's a very uh, uh, interesting technology and with a big impact to patients. Yeah, and to give you guys just like what Jack mentioned, right? So uh, this device costs about 6,000 USD. And the quality that it's generating is the same as a 30,000 camera. So for a lot of the rural areas, actually the clin clinics cannot afford a 30,000 camera, right? And that's where they come in. And then it's completely portable, doesn't require internet or cloud. So that's, it's built and designed in a way that works for a different kind of target audience. And uh, they have, uh, uh, the company is about 100 people. So they have 30 people and in their engineer team. And that's another pathway uh, bioengineer students can think about because you are actually making a difference to the world yeah. in something that's bigger. Thank you. So this is actually a Singapore company. We led the investment with the government last year. So they do pregnancy care. Traditionally, this, this technology surprisingly haven't innovated for 80 years in the human history. In the past eight years, if you, even if you go to the hospital now, so pretty much there's something called the CTG machine. Now when you're pregnant, only I guess uh, relevant to the ladies here. So uh, like you have to do, it's, it's kind of like an ultrasound related machine that you, you put all the wires on you and then with a lot of readings and once a month usually you go to the hospital and then do it to make sure your baby is safe. And then uh, it's a huge burden to a lot of the healthcare system, not as relevant to Singapore, but country like Australia, Canada, uh, it's extremely relevant. So uh, the, the company using uh, ECG machine, so which is what the science has been proven, but technology could not build uh, in the past many years, now achieve a portable, much smaller sensor uh, that the lady and the, the mother can actually take home and then do a measurement once a day. Uh, and then the data will be directly feed it to the hospital. And then imagine in a country like Australia where uh, sometimes the mother drive two hours to go to the hospital for, for a checkup. Now the, the doctor can literally tell them like, you're safe, you don't need to go. And if there's an urgency, all the data is ready with the midwives. And then when the woman goes to, when the mother goes to the hospital, they don't have to line up. They will be sent to the emergency room directly. Yeah. Uh, so these are some of the examples where healthcare startups uh, and technologies are around everyone today. Yeah. And then I uh, want to really quickly talk about the business side of things. Assuming some of the, uh, the students here will join a startup in the future. So. Uh, Meta Innovator, which is a large uh, non-profit non organization globally, they summarize the 10 of the reasons why healthcare startup fails. And uh, then uh, first reason is uh, failure to pro uh, artic articulate your value proposition. I always spend a lot of time on value prop, so I'm going to cover it in detail later. And then the second one is not having end-to-end evidence generating strategy. What does that mean? 
So as you guys are moving into healthcare sector, which is heavily regulated, as you know, if you don't really know how much clinical trial, how much evidence that you need for your FDA submission or your other regulatory submission, a lot of times you do the wrong planning, and then by the time you are submitting your uh, clinical trial, you, you run out of money and the company dies. It's actually one of the major problems why startups uh, uh, face nowadays globally. Because if you talk with Jack, you will understand different medical device actually is fit into different regulatory class. So a class three device will take much more evidence on clean human trials than a class two. So uh, even to me, we have a pre-screening lung cancer uh, technology. Uh, and then for them, the US, US FDA require them to do a two million uh, longitudes, two million patients longitude study across the country. So pretty much that means in the next next two to three years, the company is only doing clinical trials before the FDA can uh, help, can be satisfied with the results. Whereas another company, 6,000 clinical trials, get it done, get a regulatory approved. So you need to understand the regulatory impacts. And not only regulatory impacts, after you pass your FDA, the journey only gets started because you will soon realize the doctors require more evidence than the regulators. So a lot of times after you pass your regulatory, you, you think you can sell, you can become big globally, and then the, the hospital will be like, no, we don't approve. So you do a, another clinical trial with us before we're willing to use your device. And that actually causes a lot of problems on the way. And then choosing the wrong CEO. So uh, actually I used to say, I tell every startup, where 30% problems, 70% people die. So that means usually we spend a lot of the time at the beginning trying to understand is the problem, which is the value prop on the first line, that you will have claimed, is it real? Is it actually a problem that, that can bring a major impact to the, to, the, to the society? And then after we know it's a problem, we spend the rest probably four to six months understand the team, work with the team, work with the CEO to see if this person can achieve the dream that he or she has. So for the CEOs, you don't want to sound arrogant. You, want, you don't want to sound uh, understanding at all. We like CEOs who not only understand the planning and spend a lot of time at the, at, at the time to understand how to do the business, but also listen listen to different advice like different investors giving. But then uh, let's talk about the value part because I meet on average 50 to 100 startups a year, I would say. But then you will realize a lot of the good startups that's founded by the clinicians or the engineers have a common trend. So they build something that they really understand and they thought is the best thing ever. And then uh, after it's built, they launch through the market, you realize they don't actually have a market fit because when they build it, they only understand uh, from their own perspective. They think this is the best products because they spend so much time and effort into it. But then once it's launched, they realize it's not something that the market wants. And this actually is more uh, real than you think. So this is uh, uh, part of market fit pyramids. I won't go, s I won't spend too much time on this because it's a course by itself. So you start with your target uh, customer, you understand their needs. Uh, what, I, what I mean by uh, target customer, healthcare is actually really complex, which I'll explain later. So you not only have to understand the clinicians, but everyone around your product. And then uh, your value prop proposition is just simply, why will your end users pick your products? Is it faster, is it better, is it cheaper, but in what way? You, you have to be specific, right? You cannot just say, I build something better, it's faster, it's cheaper, so people will use it. No, that's actually not the truth. You, when you design the engineer, when you design the UI, UX, and the feature set, you want, you want it to be more specific. Is it, cost, is it more cost effective? What kind of dollar value that it will generate to the healthcare ecosystem? And then, uh, as I always say, healthcare is the, probably one of the most complex sector uh, for startups because you you have so many different users. A typical, for example, Grab, Uber, or TMP uh, fintech products usually you have a single or a smaller specific user. Whereas in healthcare, you have to deal with doctors, nurses, hospitals, insurance, government, regulatory, patients, obviously in the center, and. Uh, pharmaceutical device, and I can tell you right now, each one wants something different. 
And even if you split the doctor into specialists versus general versus general physicians, is they want different things. And as sad as it is, give you give you guys an example in asthma care. So we have a portfolio company that deal with asthma care. It's loved by the specialists, but then because they can actually reduce the number of like emergency emergency room visits. But then if you if you tell the same pitch to the general physicians, will make you to have less uh, customer and patients. They will actually behind your back make sure they unite with all the GPs and make sure your product never sell. So that's what I mean. You will have to really spend the time and think what does each user wants and how does each user uh, link to each other. Uh, and then other reasons why uh, healthcare startups fail. So staying in sales for too long, uh, thinking the direct to customer model will make life easier. So I'll spend a little bit of time on this because a lot of times when you build a startup, you think it's easier to sell to consumer directly. Obviously, I don't need to do regulatory anymore. I don't need to, don't need to spend months and months to deal with the hospitals, uh, procurement team, uh, and all the bigger pharmaceutical guys anymore. But it's actually not real because a system like US, Australia, or a country like that, at the end, maybe you, you do well at the beginning of first year when you're selling to consumer, but at the end, people don't want to pay uh, all of the pockets for healthcare related things. They're so used to uh, the system reimburse everything else. So they will expect this will be reimbursed. And by that time, it's already too late. So for healthcare products, uh, uh, B2B to C, which is you deal with the hospitals, clinicians, and then they refer the device into uh, consumers, it's a general approach. Uh, and then choosing the wrong initial direction, uh, that pretty much means if you design the products, amazing products that can deal with three or three different, four different kind of disease, usually people stick with the disease they understand the most. But uh, actually, you should actually look through the uh, value proposition for each one and understand which which is the one that has the biggest value as a business. And the last one, product doesn't fit into existing workflow. This is actually an uh, interesting one because uh, so many startups tell me, I built something that's revolutionary, I built something that can disrupt. Uh, think again, you cannot disrupt that easy. The healthcare system has been existing for like hundreds of years. And uh, even if you build something that can generate the value into the healthcare system and the patients, uh, when you deal with the clinicians, you understand recorded they don't like change and a lot of times clinicians are the hardest one to pers persuade things to be changed because they have been doing the same thing they've been trained the same way and they always think they're right yeah. so as a result when you design something the clinician user interface and also the nurse user interface becomes becomes something important but then last three uh, needs understanding the payment reimbursement uh, dynamics. As I mentioned, you have to think, you cannot tell the investor that this will be in the next five, five years reimbursed 100%. A lot of times it doesn't work like that. So you have to really do your homework and research to see how does it really work. Uh, putting too much money and effort into pilot programs, uh, staying your uh, equal timber. So pretty much when you're dealing with a bigger player like pharmaceutical companies, they are demanding. And a lot of times it takes uh, eight to 10 months to build a pilot and to make them happier. I want to sign a contract with your, with your products. So a lot of times the smaller team will drain all their resources into that. And by the time they realize uh, it's not gonna work, it's too late. Yeah. So uh, given the time I have, a last bit of career advice. Uh, I don't know bioengineer as much as uh, business, but like Jack mentioned, uh, start early. I think the one tip I really want to stress uh, in our is start early. Uh, what year are the students? The yeah, final year. Oh, so they still year. they still early. Okay, they yeah. still early. <laughs> but uh, what I mean is like nowadays in the summer, instead of uh, go to vacation, do different things, you can apply different kind of internships, right? If you want to see what, uh, if you want to work work in pharmaceutical company, medical medical device company, startups or even a lot of the financial funds now look for bioengineer students, you should give a different try when you're earlier. So maybe, for example, in your second year, you try a different startup internship. In year three, you try uh, investment fund internship. 
because that gave you different exposures and then will allow you to really understand if this is something that you really like to do for the rest of your career, for example. So start early and planning early is always uh, advised. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ma. I want to echo the. Uh, Ma, Ma, you stay there because there, there will be many questions. Uh, 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 I echo about the point you mentioned to start early because uh, uh, even at the beginning of this uh, module, you may remember I suggest you to do your career plan thing because uh, once you have a direction or maybe the so called value proposition of yourself with no company then you will start able to gather the relevant knowledge and network. Then that start earlier. You know, you don't wait for, uh, you know, 30 years old or until you graduate, then you start knowing what's going on in the market, what job suitable for you, like that. Uh, so uh, again, um, uh, that's good, Ma also mentioned this. But Ma, maybe one question about the, the career tips is, uh, you know, you also look for intern. Mm -hmm. Let's say there are hundreds of intern apply. How can you select, mm, I, I like this intern, you know, you can fit your your company. What will be your selection criteria or, or maybe dangerous question when you ask most, most intern will die, you know, like that. Uh, I mean, they cannot, they, they, they don't handle well. Or like we're much nicer. <laughs> yeah. But uh, as I always tell the students, at least in business, business school, right, when you're younger, you want to have breath. Uh, because as you, when you are younger, you have opportunity and chance to uh, pick and try something that you don't like. So you want to try as much uh, of different experiences as possible. And starting an internship is not about making money, it's more about the learning. So you, like I, I always tell all my interns, this is like a platform. How much you get out of it, depending on how much you put in. So it's like, if you work hard enough and you get more exposure experience in all of the internships. And then back to the, how usually we, when we look at the undergrad students, we don't expect their experts to be an expert. You guys are still students. I probably know a lot more than me when I was a student. So we just look for attitude. So attitude, attitude actually counts towards uh, probably 60% 60, 60 of the game. Because you, mm -hmm. and you'll be surprised nowadays some young uh, students don't care as much <laughs> so, yeah, and attitude not just means uh, you go to work and be ethical, it means you work hard, you want to stay initiative, you want to add value uh, to the business. Even though you're not giving a task, you're thinking, how do I make this better? Do I? Yeah. Do I? I like that one, I want to add that, the attitude, because the attitude you cannot fake, you know. Do you like this job? Uh, of course I like. But again, you know, that comes to the career plan is, if you start thinking about your career then even right now, you know that it's based on your strength, you like something, this is something you dream about, and that's why you go for this job interview. And then that's why, and then maybe Mark asks you this question. When you explain why you like this job, you know, you're not coming from an empty heart. You said, oh, I think about that before. This is my style, my strength, my stream, my aspiration. And that's why I learned this, I do that, and I come to this job. Then to mark the world, this guy, you know, really think about that, really like my job for, for, for many good reasons. And that's the, the preparation, the passion behind that may impress people. Uh, uh, like, yeah, like Jack said, I, uh, I always believe nothing is wasted, especially mm -hmm. in your age right now. Because uh, sometimes you just don't see the bigger picture, but maybe 10 years ago you learned something I learned 10 years back actually becomes useful. So if I look back for my career plan, a uh, career path, I think uh, everything I have learned in the past many years built to uh, what we are today, and that allows me to do the things that I can do now. Right. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a question from from Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Did, 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 I don't record this. Uh, you say it louder, maybe louder. Yeah. And also when we rank, because I used to work in bigger consulting firms, so when you when we used to rank for juniors, uh, actually you'll be surprised attitude counts uh, more than more than half a game. Yeah, if if you really make your you work hard, make the team likes you, usually people have a good impression about you. Oh, so the people people management side is important, huh? That's why. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's that's good important skill. Yeah. 
Yeah. We never expect the junior to understand, be able to do the job right off the bat. That's why usually there's we train the interns, there's training programs and for the bigger company that have more structure than right. different kind of classes. Yeah. So along your career path, like throughout the years, what what would you say is the most difficult thing for you? Well, this is an interview one. question, so mm -hmm. I like that. Um, <laughs> actually, uh, different challenges has been there across my entire career journey, right? When I first started, I was in a very competitive market. Back then, after the crisis, there's no much jobs. And then literally, uh, for a job that should be easy to get in, now it's become like six different schools fighting for one position, and then to get into the job, right? So I literally thought, very hard when I was in the undergrad, what kind of experiences uh, do I need uh, in order to even get an interview. And then uh, I was lucky enough to get into the job and then I, I thought about, like I was working in a bigger company, so I started my career in PwC. Then I thought about like what kind of uh, things I can leverage out of the company. So as a, as a global player, and uh, an employer, they have succumbed and you can actually work three years, get your CA uh, or your professional license, and then just become go to become a relaxed job. Or at the same time, in the three years, I never change, I, I never repeated a single client, always rotate different kind of clients. I rotated departments, I went to different countries, do some comments, and then those those exposure really taught me a lot. And then when I finally made it into private equity, as I always wanted, I realized it's not something I want. Yeah, for life, the money was great, but then. Uh, there's no meaning. Uh, now I'm much happier because I believe I'm making a difference. And then you actually, when you see your startups grow, because we work with the CEOs a lot, like you actually feel uh, you're doing, uh, you're contributing to the best extent of what you can. Uh, so when I was in DE, it's, as you guys know, probably it's like getting getting into Google or Apple. It's not the easiest thing to get into. So, Again, all the preparation work and all the luck, all the networking I had to do beforehand. And then when I was doing the uh, mega deals in private equity, I started to meet uh, successful entrepreneur who taught me there's more than just uh, making money. There is actually, by doing the right thing, you can make a difference and also making money. So when I joined the family offices, we didn't have this uh, impact investment fund. So imagine I'm not a doctor, physician, or even a science major, start something like this with completely no network in Singapore and no background information. So that's another challenge that we face. And then we say we grow uh, decently in the past few years. Yeah. And then even right now, I'm learning every day because every time I, I see a new startup, it's a completely different <laughs> sector. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Any more questions? Yeah. Talk to you, please. Um, so when you are looking at a new startup, do you have a set plan for what you look for? Um, do you have like a checklist, um, or do you base it off like the company itself, the people? Um, like, what do you um, look at when you're first investing yeah. in a startup? You know, this is a different presentation uh, altogether, but uh, in general, pretty much we started with uh, because we uh, finance people are not the most entry people as well. So when you make the pitch deck, you have to be very clear on what you're delivering, right? Assuming we, we like the idea, we like the startups, and then we spend a big chunk of the time in the beginning understanding the products and also understanding why your technology can, can uh, be a solution to the problem. And then after that, we move on to the markets. We, we take a look to see if this market is big enough to actually for us to become interested. Uh, for example, if it's only, actually this is true in Taiwan, uh, we went to a company. I think we calculated the total market size globally, I think it's uh, 50,000 people or like 100,000 people. Then it's an interesting technology, but then uh, the size of the impact, it won't become a great business out of this. And assuming you have a potential, you have a chance to become mega, we don't expect our startups, startups to become electronics by the way. So, uh, then we look at the business plan. We look at, we start to look at the details from budget to valuation to your uh, IP strategy to your uh, current uh, business partnerships and to your, for example, for hardware, actually I always say 50% uh, of the fail due to manufacturers. 
That's why when we build the funds, they spend a lot of the time uh, networking and working with the good manufacturers globally. So uh, a lot of times the bioengineering students or the CEO clinicians, they might be a great engineer, but then when it comes to manufacturing, it's a completely different game. Because if you've never been on the plant, there are so many different things that, that can go wrong. Yeah. To give you an idea, there was a, it was in China, so there was one plant that was doing really well until one uh, experienced engineer retired. And then after the experienced engineer retired, none of the batches just started to function anymore. And then they spent six months investigating why. And then because everything was, nothing was changed besides a person has changed. And then after they, they spent six months, like probably thousands of dollars investigating, went through all the video recording, they realized what this guy does is every time there's a new piece, they take a knife, then do a tick, and then put it back up. And that comes with experience. Uh, thus, imagine if your business, you, you got an order from Apple that has a million pieces, and then your manufacturer tells you the next day, hey, uh, you cannot produce. So, yeah. Uh, so we, we do look at the business as a whole, and we do have a checklist and uh, different kind of things. But as I summarized at the beginning, it's 70% 70, 70 is about the people. If we like the people and we believe they have what it takes, they will never give up and take the business uh, through all the obstacles, then uh, we are willing to back the people. Thank you. That's a very good question. But you know, um uh, I, I see these questions a lot of time to different professions. Oh, you are auditor, do you have a checklist? Oh, you are boss, do you have a checklist to decide somebody's promotion? You know, all that kinds of things. But, but after I see this answer from different professions more and more, I realize life is not very black and white now. You know, you don't have checklist for everything. It's like police doing investigation. They don't go for a checklist to decide, oh, this guy still a thing or don't you know they 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 at the end is uh, the checklist will be a reference there, there are tons of checklists uh, there, there are tons of uh, pitching dissertation you can check in the youtube you know how the people can present their 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 project make it impressive to the to the investor there are no one there's formula no, yeah there's no right or wrong right like my mentor taught me uh, when you build a business you should spend the time and think all the possible ways that business can go wrong. And if you have a plan for that, the only thing left is to be successful. Yeah. 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 So so it's really, you know, up to the investor kinds of chemistry, the trust, you know, the passion you present your product, and of course the facts is about what problem you solve, what solution you bring in, is it really whether well they that, that solid thing, that would be the so-called 40%. But 60%, you want to see the energy behind this person to drive this happen. Uh, so uh, 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 very, very not back and white stuff. But that's the fun part, you know, it's an investment. It's not a simple calculation uh, game uh, like that. And also, I was uh, listening to a speech made by one of the most successful funds globally, the founding partner. They, they invest in tech. So it's a totally different game than medical. But then they produce, I think, 30 unicorns, uh, in, uh, at least 30 unicorns in, in the past uh, number of years. And then she always say when they do it, they look, they meet at least the top 10 people in the company. And then if your number 10 employee is better than the number three employee in your competitor, then there's no reason for you to fail. Ooh, okay. <laughs> But we do meet the team. It's not just we meet the CEO, we like the CEO, and that's it. A lot of times, we work with different elements in the team, trying to understand how the chemistry is working, how the products is uh, put together. Mm -hmm. yeah. So at the end, still come down to people, right? The people, the people, people, people becomes a great part of it. Right. Good, good, thank you. Any, any, any more questions? Okay, okay, thank you again, Mark. Please also subscribe our channel and click the bell button for future updates. Thanks for watching.